let's get ourselves right into promoting yourself beyond your resume. And really, it's this is kind of a marketing discussion. And your resume is very much a marketing document. It is a way, really, to promote yourself and let people know about yourself and your skills. And we'll talk a little bit about what's on your resume, what's not on your resume, and see about how getting information about you out into the uh, more public domain will be easy and effective for you to do so. And that's what our goal is today. Okay, so when you think about it, why do we have resumes in the first place? Well, a lot of us know that it's to get a job, but actually that's not true. A resume doesn't get you a job, it gets you an interview. The interview gets you the job. So what you want to do is be found and entice hiring managers to call you in for the interview. That's what the resume is for. So it's certainly needed for your job search. It's certainly very relevant. Um, it is required when you apply for a job, especially when you apply online or one of the applicant tracking systems or um, on any of the um, job board pages that everyone wants the resume. So yes, you can post on the job board so you can be found there. And it's used to document your work history. It's kind of in a concise document, whether it's one, two, three, or more pages, that's what it really does. And you give it to anybody in your network, or anyone that you know, or anyone that you've met, and that's really what you're hoping to be able to do as best as possible. And think about the things that you do put on your resume. Now, we're not gonna deep dive into resume best practices. If a question comes up, I'll answer it, but that's not as much the goal of this program. But certainly you have your contact information on your resume so that uh, as people receive your resume and are interested, they have an easy way to find you. Of course, that could be phone number, email address, LinkedIn, all those things. Your employment history kind of goes without saying, your list of employers and employment dates, and also accomplishments. Those kind of become the bullet points you know, on your resume, accomplishments. Sometimes we like to put duties or things we were asked to do that way, but accomplishment stories are much more powerful. Uh, your education, your training history, your certifications that you may have had after a more formal education, you put those there as well, because those can entice hiring managers as well. Uh, any professional groups and professional associations that you belong to, um, having those in your resume show your involvement in your profession and may uh, spark interest in the people looking at your resume. So it could be very powerful as well. And other things like maybe other volunteer activities or other activities that you're involved with that you can re relate to um, your profession or you a bit personally. So a lot of that is the kind of information that's typically on your resume. And while that sounds like a lot, there's really a lot of stuff that's not on your resume. And that stuff we'll talk about in a moment and how you get that out, really what could differentiate you from other people that are being considered for the same position. For example, the context and challenges of your work. Just because you've worked at a company for five years and another company for more or less, um, you might have some of your responsibilities and accomplishments, but you know we really know that our work accomplishments had a lot of challenges and, and how you face them, the details that doesn't come across in your resume. Why you have personal interests. It's nice that you volunteer someplace, you posted that. Why? That could be of interest to somebody as well. Things that you're passionate about. There could be um, um, causes and charities, the, uh, different types of creativity, you know, the arts, music and such. Uh, hard to come across on a resume, especially if these things are not tied to your career. And most of your personality really does not come through in your resume. Matter of fact, we often discourage that when we create a resume, because you may say, well, I'll use fancy fonts, I'll use fancy formatting, fancy colors. But sometimes some of the things that you add to give your uh, resume a visual pizzazz kind of throw off the applicant tracking system. So we say remove some of those. So that's a little unfortunate, but a lot of your personality does not come through on your resume. And the depth of your professional experience, that's much different than the years of service but it's you know, how deeply you've gotten into any of the, the career paths that you've been involved with. Um, what have you learned along the way? Uh, your interactions with other people and all that kind of stuff. So it really doesn't come through as readily, just not on your resume. But this information, this is the good stuff. This is what people get hired for, uh, not just what's on the resume. So we'll take a little step 
aside, but it really blends in very much with what we're talking about, is when you think about the employers, why do you Google employers? So you may be interested in sending a resume, or you did to a company, and you're going to Google the employer, that company. And if you think about it, well, you want to learn more about the company, learn more about uh, you know what's there. You want to get information maybe about the interviewer or the interviewers, give you a little bit of, uh, do a little bit of research to help you be uh, more productive in the interview. Uh, maybe you'll search for people in your network that have connections into that company you're about to interview with or have connections to the interviewers. And you can do some research that way as well. Ask people that you know that you're connected with about what they know about other people. It's nice to get another opinion. Um, you may discover information that's not in the job description, and you probably will discover information that's not in the job description. Job description talks about very few things relatively in your job that you're applying to, but there's a lot of information about the company, and um, especially if it's a publicly traded company, there's a lot of public information. So you want to get that as well to help you prepare and do research. So when you think about it, what you find that is not on the job description is just as important, maybe more important than what you do find in the job description. So it's all that stuff that's not there. So that's why we use Google, but hiring managers use Google as well. And why are they doing that? Because the information that they find that's not on your resume may be just as important or more important to them as what is on your resume. And so that's why we wanna promote ourselves beyond the resume. So typically, who sees your resume? Well, really, anyone you share it with. That's the limit. If you've applied to 20 jobs, then 20 people saw the resume, or maybe a couple more at the company. Of course, if you apply through an applicant tracking system, it's possible very few of any people may have actually seen the resume if the computer pre-screened you. So only the people that you share it with. But digitally, if, you're, if you go beyond your resume, lots of people can see the content. Lots of people can learn about you. So promoting yourself with other tools could be a way to be found and promote information about you, uh, especially when they only have your resume or not even seeing it. For example, you want to let hiring managers find out more about you. So you may use some tools, which we'll get into in a moment, the different types of tools, to provide more information. Your resume may say that uh, you belong to a certain charitable organization or you volunteered, and this could talk about your passion. So there's a lot of information that you could put out there. You create the information that you want to promote. So especially you know, using um, online sources, social media and others, some people are concerned about information that's out there. But because you're promoting it, it's on your social media sites, it's your posts, it's your activity, you get to control the information that you want to promote. You get to control the message. And by the way, with this information, this bullet point about you control the information you want to promote, there are a lot of people who will say they don't want to be online. They don't want to be digital. They don't want to be on social media because they don't want people finding out a lot of private information about them. And I get that. But when you think about it, that private information is out there. They can find your phone number, your address, and maybe hackers have found your social security number. I hope that's not the case. And maybe they've stolen your password when they hacked into the email server. You just never know. That's not what you're sharing. You're not sharing your personal stuff. You're not publishing your credit cards, and your social security information. So don't worry about what you promote. You'll control the message. And by controlling the message, you only share with the information that you want to share. You get to demonstrate professionally what's really important to you and personally as well. And so that's the message that you want to get out. You get to show that you are an expert in your field because you're talking about, at least in the written word, or if you're using uh, video oriented, to, I guess you're talking, you get to show it's really important to you that you're the expert in your field that your resume implies that you are. It gets to really validate that. And if there is any negative stuff out there, you get to neutralize it. The only way you can neutralize stuff that's out on the internet about you is to put more information on the internet that's very positive and affirming about what you are in the back professionally, about your background. So uh, a, a number of years ago, in about 2008, uh, we were looking to hire a new chief information officer, and I was one of four directors that would report to this person. 
And senior manager did an executive search and then gave four resumes to the four of us. And then we had an opportunity to then interview these four people. Well, we each did a Google search on each of the four people. And with one of the people, these chief information officer candidates, we found there was a lot of information out there that he was involved with lawsuits against his company. Now, we, we were sure he didn't do anything, but we're not positive. Uh, he didn't put a lot of contradictory information out there. We decided we didn't want the baggage, but there was negative stuff that was out there. And maybe if he had worked a little harder then to control the message about how productive and strong he was, we may have brought him in anyway. Well, we brought in the three other people. We hired one. He was my boss for a number of years, a very nice guy. But you can neutralize negative stuff that's out there. And I'll give you an example. If today you were considering shopping for a car, it was just time to replace your car, might you consider shopping for a car built by Toyota? Unfortunately, the we're not able to raise hands and, and shout out and nod and yes, no, because I've got that part of my screen minimized. But in, a lot of people would say, yes, they would consider. It doesn't mean you're bu buying the Toyota, but you would consider Toyota as a brand. Would you consider shopping for a Honda? And certainly there might be a lot of people who would say that they would consider shopping for the brand, a car in the brand of Honda. But when you think about it, why? Why would you do that? Don't you remember the news from a few years ago? There were Toyota Camrys where the gas pedal stuck and people had accidents. That's horrible. Why would you buy a car from a company where the gas pedal sticks? It was a, a few model years of the Toyota Camry and, and Corolla. And you can't forget all the news around um, Honda. Honda had those airbag explosions. So if you were in a front end or rear collision and the airbag uh, inflated, it's possible they would have exploded and some of the metal material inside could have cut you or killed you. There were, it was terrible on the news. And so right about now, some of you may be going, oh yeah, maybe I won't consider a Honda and Toyota, but really think about it. They're still very strong brands. They're considered very reliable. And the reason why is they controlled the message. The negative stuff in the news, it was really very little. The, the actual cases. Of course, it was all over the news. It's sensationalism is what sells in the news. But Toyota and Honda were very strong at controlling the message. And they were standing behind their vehicles and their brand. And people still have a lot of faith in Toyota. My wife has a, a Honda Accord. Uh, we got our airbag replaced and they stood behind it. Didn't cost us anything. So that's why you can control a negative message or an example of how you can do that. So here we are at our first intermission point before we get into any of the, um, the tools that maybe we could use. And if you have a question, put it in chat and I will go take a look. And there's a hello from Peter, so hello. So um, again, if you wanna ask a question at this point, you're certainly, I invite you certainly to do so. And um, you can click on the chat icon, the little cartoon call out and type your question and I will be happy to answer. If not, you can uh, grab a bagel sandwich or a cup of coffee, you run to the restroom if you need to. I just brought my bottle of water here with me. Otherwise, of course, we will have time at the end of the presentation as well. We'll be heading into the meat of tools and programs in just a moment. Okay. Nothing yet, and that's okay. So then let us proceed. Okay, intermission is over, draw back the curtains. So let's talk about your LinkedIn profile. Now, unfortunately, we can't deep dive in this presentation into LinkedIn. If you have specific questions, I will do my best to answer them. And we'll be talking about some of the other online tools as well. And we can't deep dive into the how to use them, um, but we'll talk a little bit about why you would want to consider using tools like these. So LinkedIn, it's the number one social media website for professionals. Um, as of the second quarter of this year, so a few months ago, they reported 675 million users and over 500,000 are recruiters. And recruiters actually use a different tool. They use a tool called LinkedIn Recruiter. It's connected to the same database, 
but it's a different front end application that has much stronger searching and recruiting tools. So recruiters really like LinkedIn because of the, the tools that are available. And it's also less expensive than a lot of the other job boards for the recruiters to use. So over 675, and what's nice is compared to some of the other social media platforms, it's not grandmothers and kids sharing photos and, and vacation stories. This is really professional oriented, business oriented. And so really for job seekers, this would likely be one of the first tools, if not the only tool or, or first, or actually the first tool you would use. And the reason why is we are all in a business to business mode. We are all searching professionally. You may be interested in working for a company that's a consumer-based company, but a good place to find the company and the people in them is a professional social media site like LinkedIn. It is used by HR, it's used by hiring managers, it's used by recruiters. Um, they look for people usually using searching on role, title, all sorts of keywords. They have a lot of uh, flexibility in their LinkedIn recruiter tool. Um, you can also use it to research possible candidates. That's what they're using it for. You can use it also to gather information and create job descriptions. That's what they're using it for. Um, posting, like I mentioned, is less expensive and sometimes is free offers also than the job board sites. But mostly it's a lot less expensive when it's used by human resources. It's not as limiting for you as your resume. Now, you know, there's different discussions. How many pages should a resume be? Um, it doesn't matter because if it's two pages, it's two pages. And if it's three pages, it's three pages. But in LinkedIn, you could put a lot of information throughout the um, uh, your, your profile page. So it's not as limiting in size and content. And then plus, the moment you give out your resume, it's now history. But your LinkedIn profile, you can update continuously. So it's always as current as possible. And it's free. LinkedIn is completely free. And on all, basically all the important things for us to use as job seekers is completely free. Now they do have paid subscription models that do give you additional tools and you have to decide if you feel it's worth your while to do that. Um, it's about $25 or $29 a month to use LinkedIn, uh, the professional version. Uh, you can even try it for one month for free. You do get additional in-mail, which is their email program. So you get to uh, send emails from within LinkedIn to people beyond your first degree connection. The free version, you can only connect and, and link to somebody and email people that you're connected to. Um, you can also look back at the people that have looked at your profile. In the free version, you can only look back, I think it's a couple of days. They limit you in even the number that they show. But in the paid version, I believe it's 90 days now, you can look back. So that could be handy. You could see who looked at your profile. And then with your in-mails, you can write them a, a nice in-mail message. Uh, hello, my name's David. I saw that you looked at my profile. I'm wondering if there's something of interest that you'd like to speak with, speak about. So you have that ability. It's harder to do that with the free version. So there are certain things. LinkedIn Learning, which is their education tool, is available also from the paid version. So you get a lot with the paid, but you have to decide if it's worth your investment. And again, you can try it for free for a month. You can also use it for one or two months and then stop. So it's up to you. I'm a big fan of websites, not just being an IT guy, but um, websites, very few job seekers have their own websites. And especially if you're an IT person, and then the next step, if you are a web developer, a software developer, it's a great way to show off some of your development skills by building your own website. So it is very important for promoting your brand online. Uh, people, when they search for things through a Google search or a Bing search, you get a result set, you put in your keywords in the field and you get a list of stuff back. The list are all websites. And you may say, no, it's Facebook. Well, Facebook is a website, facebook.com. And so it's a list of websites. And even if it's a, a link to a PDF or a user manual or something, they're actually all files in websites. So that's all that brings back. So if you wanna be found in a Google search easily, build your um, the website. So it does let you be found easily online. It's certainly much more robust than your resume and it's more robust than LinkedIn because you get to control not only the content, you could post a lot more content on your website. You could organize it a little differently. Some people don't like 
the logical structure of LinkedIn. You can add a lot more pictures, post a lot more documents. It's a lot easier to present the information you want in a website than in a lot of other platforms. LinkedIn has gotten a little better. You can attach documents, you can do things like that, but just having your own website makes it a lot easier much more robust and it's more dynamic than your resume because as i mentioned before your resume is history once you hand it to somebody if there's something new you want to talk about you put that on your website so you will have your web address on your website certainly i'm sorry your resume certainly um, so um, but you could put a lot more information there on your website so consider getting a personal website some of the tools there are a lot of tools out there but some of them that make it quick and easy uh, Wix, Squarespace, Weebly, uh, they're some of the easier tools to use. You may try using those. A couple of them have free models as well. You may start with those. Facebook. Facebook is the number one social media website, and I should add, on the planet. Uh, as of the second quarter of this year, they've reported 2.7 billion, with a B, billion users. More than a quarter of the planet uses Facebook. Just incredible. Uh, when you think about that, this is one software platform that's resonated well with so many people. It's number one in the world. It's primarily used for business to consumer. So there tend to be a lot of non-professional people on it. Nothing wrong with that at all. But just realize that that tends to be what the content uh, is. At least that's how it often started. Companies are using it more and more. They have their business pages. They're promoting. They're advertising. They are posting jobs on Facebook. Um, they can do their own posts, so it does become important. In their mind, they're often targeting more consumers than they're looking to target other businesses. That's just statistically what Facebook is used for, okay? But it is used to share information about the business, inform clients and prospects of specials that are going on. You can certainly steer traffic to a website through um, uh, Facebook, so that becomes important as well. And um, you know, they're also promoting jobs in Facebook. So you could find a lot of information about a company in Facebook. So even if you're not thinking of Facebook as the first place you want to be to post a professional profile, you can certainly use it to do your research in your job search, and that can be very powerful, certainly. Um, and yes, it is used for business. The one thing is be careful of who you quote unquote friend. And the reason why is it is possible with security that people that find your profile will see the profiles of some of your Facebook friends. And those friends could be professional peers, they could be family members, they could be you know, household people, it doesn't really matter. But think about this, someone may have put a very innocent photo of uh, being on the beach, wearing a bathing suit, the sun is setting behind and there's a whole bunch of people and you've got drinks in your hand. You never know what someone is thinking. It could just be you're celebrating the sunset when you're on vacation. Great. Could also be you're hanging out with your friends getting drunk. You don't know how that's perceived. You also don't know and you can't control the messages that your friends are posting. For instance, what if they're posting very pol strong political messages? A lot of times when you're job searching, you want to be politically neutral. It doesn't mean you don't have an opinion. You're just not sharing it in a public forum. And that's very common that people do keep their political views and others private. But if you're connected to a, a, a friend or family member who's posting a lot of political views, doesn't matter which side of the aisle, if it disagrees with the hiring manager, you probably won't get called. So you may have to consider unfriending certain people uh, that you are otherwise friends with, or just not connect to people other than for professional use. Also tighten down your security, so it makes it harder for people to see your friends' posts. Twitter, Twitter's kind of a fun one. Uh, I use Twitter occasionally. Um, you can write anything you want, but you're limited to 280 characters used to be 140. So people got very creative with LOLs and I see you, you know, it's a three letters to say. So um, very much like um, texting, they use their own little abbreviated language. So you do have to be a little careful when you're writing tweets that are business oriented, that you do write a lot of grammatically and spelled correct tweets. But it's not really used to write long posts. 280 characters is very limiting. Um, Twitter had, as of the beginning of the year, 330 million users. Uh, actually, uh, last year, they had a few more. Twitter has gone through a process of 
trying to weed out some users and there's some controversy related to it and i think facebook is doing this as well ones that are putting very inappropriate content and i won't go into the details of that um, but uh, so they did have a few more million users but they've been attentive to keeping it a, a much more uh, professional and friendly site it is used by professionals you let followers know about an article of interest so the professionals are doing that that could be you you could post this is what's of interest to me or if you're in my field you want to learn about this and put a link you can let people know about an upcoming event or a recent accomplishment and certainly companies use that all the time to promote things that are going on so companies are on twitter you may want to start following twitter twitter doesn't have friends they have followers and you can send your followers to a website or a blog site and so um, that becomes uh, another way of important important way of using twitter if you're not sure about twitter's effectiveness it's only 280 characters you can't write a lot not making a political discussion here but just ask the president of the united states politics aside president trump does use twitter very effectively and i'll give you an example of how a lot of people are not using twitter just not people haven't always gravitated to it just yet. And so you may not be getting or have the opportunity to see the president's tweets because you're not on Twitter or you're not following the president, that's okay. But you're still hearing about it because other people are picking that up and then letting others know. The news picks up uh, political tweets all the time from all different people. So it is a very powerful platform because someone will receive your tweet, that's the message, and retweet, which is forwarded to other people, and gets spread. And certainly, you know, any president and a lot of politicians do have a very large audience, a very large number of followers. So they will, messages will be heard and seen. There's some other social media sites that are out there. Let's talk about them and really at a high level. What is meetup.com? It's the number one dating site in the world. That's not what it is. Uh, Meetup is not a dating site, although there are probably some groups that are for singles only, certainly. But these are uh, digital groups that are meant to host local in-person events. It's a way of kind of advertising and promoting uh, groups and organizations that might meet in person, but they're using this digital platform to uh, get attention and to find members. You get to create a profile, and it's a good idea to put lots of keywords in the profile. It's not hard. It's a lot simpler than LinkedIn is. But what Meetup will do is it will go through all its profiles, and when it sees a profile of a group that matches a profile of some of the, the members, it'll send you an email. So you may get an email one day that says, hey, Mount Laurel has a project managers group. Go, don't go. It's up to you if you want to go, but Meetup will help facilitate those introductions. It's kind of like LinkedIn groups on steroids, just really powerful and a very strong platform. YouTube, uh, you know, we do know YouTube certainly about all the, the, you know, cat chasing ball videos and everything else that's on there. I like watching a lot of the old comedy videos. I know Nancy's on this call. She likes live comedy. So Nancy, I like dead comedy. <laughs> Sadly, the people have passed away, but some of them are really funny. So I'll watch the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson with some of the comedians. It's been owned by Google since 2006. So in Google searches, Google likes Google. Google likes promoting Google stuff. So if you develop a YouTube channel where you can post your own videos, um, Google will begin to find you in those Google searches on YouTube. Google will look at YouTube. So it's very good for um, video sharing and video promotion. Um, they've got a mobile app as well for using that as well. So you might consider YouTube. Instagram. Instagram now has over a billion users. It's actually the number two uh, social media platform. Again, for um, mobile and uh, use for photo and video sharing. And so a great platform for uh, promoting your stuff. You might record your elevator pitch and put it out there. You might have a video version of your resume and put it on these platforms. I know a number of job seekers who use YouTube to promote themselves. Great platform for doing so. Okay. Tell you what, before we get into blogging and some of the others, I will take a break here. I see that there are some questions that are beginning to pop up. So why don't we stop and answer them so it's a little bit more timely. Am I wearing pants? No, no, that wasn't a question. Um, so Mike asked, 
Who can you contact to set up a personal website? Can you expand on this? Um, so uh, cheap advertising, uh, I'm a web guy, so you can talk with me if you need a little bit of direction. Um, but there are a lot of people that do um, web programming. And so uh, uh, you can certainly speak to anyone who's a web developer, web programmer. I'm not sure what I can expand on. I mean, a personal website is a website in a lot of ways, not much different than a professional website or a business website. Um, there are some things like um, e-commerce that are a little bit different and you don't, you're not going to do that for a personal website. You're probably going to look for a handful of web pages and we'll put information out there. You can even take your resume and start putting sections of your resume and expanding on those. But you're going to look for someone who's a website programmer and um, and they should be able to help you. It's also possible the library has classes. Uh, I don't know, I haven't looked at this library's class schedule, but I remember the Princeton Public Library had uh, classes on introduction to WordPress, introduction to Google Blogger, actually I taught that one, and so that's an option. Um, maybe some adult school, you know, that may be an option as well. And so Nancy has a question. If my Facebook posts are shared with my friends only, does that work for preventing recruiters who aren't my friends from seeing them? Um, I don't know. Um, even though I'm an IT guy, I'm actually not a big Facebook person. I don't spend a lot of time on Facebook because I'm not a B2C uh, person. I'm more of a B2B person, so I don't spend as much time. So I can't tell you the nuances of Facebook security. My gut tells me that my gut tells me that if you're posting even to your friends, it may be available on your profile because you're posting. But I'm sorry, I just don't know the security level. But I see you do post a lot um, for Instagram for your shop. <laughs> yeah, certainly. If you don't know Nancy, she has she calls it a curiosity shop. Um, not quite like an antique store, but a lot of unique items. Not a bad idea to post. Uh, the images of those on Instagram or any video or imaging platform could be a big help. And I'm glad to see you don't post anything bad, so that's good. There's one gentleman I knew from uh, PSG of Mercer County, a job seeker group in uh, Princeton every Friday morning. And he was at the group for a while and he landed a consulting assignment. And I knew his political views were conservative, and that's fine. I didn't mind that at all. After he landed, and I was connected with him on LinkedIn, he was posting a lot of political, conservative political opinion that was very strongly conservative. It, it didn't resonate with me. I wasn't offended. But, uh, and this was about three years ago. And I happened to catch up to him at a, a bar restaurant, an event, and good to see him, how's the job going, all that kind of stuff. And I said, you know, I, I think you may want to quiet some of your political views down because you never know if anyone else is going to take offense by it, how it may affect your career. But he basically explained he's he's not ashamed of his view. That's fine. And uh, he's going to continue posting things that are important to him. So do be careful when you're posting that sometimes when it's very politically charged, you know, they say, you know, you don't talk about sex and politics, that kind of thing, then um, you'll, you may reach people with opposing view that um, won't want to talk further with you, especially in job search. So just be a little careful about some of the things that you post. But we will get right into blogging. So I am a blogger as well. It's available on my website. And it's basically, it's either a website or it could just be a page on your website. And what it does is it allows you to write these articles and they're called posts. And um, actually, if some of you may not know, the word blog is actually an abbreviation from, it's almost funny to say a 20th century word. We used to call them weblogs. So uh, one word, weblog, but it got shortened to blog. And the action of writing a blog is blogging. Okay. But the type of information, you know, you write a few short paragraphs. This is not going to be the Iliad and Odyssey. This is not big, big information. It can be your opinion. It doesn't have to be something new. If you're really writing something new, you probably want to look at some sort of professional journal, something where you can really get credit and build upon it. But a lot of times you share your opinion, your approach to something, how you would tackle something, how you're helping somebody. 
Um, you can post on your own site. I think that's a great idea to do because it'll be attached to your own website. People will find you. And maybe there are industry sites that are managed by other people. You can post there. You can post in Facebook, on LinkedIn, and other places as well. And what's nice with those uh, uh, social media sites, when you post on LinkedIn, when you post on Facebook, um, they're attached to your profile. So people do associate them. So do consider writing these short posts, letting people know something about the industry you're in, the role you're in, your approach to managing, your approach to working, all stuff like that. Anything that could be considered helpful and you could be considered a thought leader. You get to demonstrate your expertise. You get to demonstrate your passion. So clearly, if like me, being an IT person, I do write about a lot of IT topics and I write them in layperson's hands. So I really talk about tech topics, but I'm not talking to a technical audience. I'm talking to an audience of people certainly, you know, can understand what I'm writing, but not using a lot of acronyms and tech terms. That's my audience. If your audience is going to be more business centric, you can use a lot more of the acronyms and tech terms. And over time, you will develop and grow your brand because people will begin to see you. And, you know, if you're an author, you must be an expert. And blogging is a means of writing and a means of becoming an author. So this can be very powerful. Podcasts. Podcasts are kind of the video version of blogs. And for some people, blogs are considered old because they've been around for over 20 years. Podcasts have really only been the last five years or maybe a little longer that they've really become popular. As internet speeds have become faster and less expensive, easier to, for people to have um, high speed internet, they can watch more video content. Cameras are becoming less expensive and smaller easier to control even by a lay person. So a podcast is basically a digital audio presentation. It could be video as well. It could be recorded live, or it could be, um, uh, it could be presented live, or it could be recorded. And people can listen to them when they want. They can download them and listen to them. It's really a great platform. It's kind of being you know, your own uh, radio show host or your own TV show host. And there are a bunch of platforms that are out there for that. Um, you know, people listen all the time, at the, and sometimes the oddest times. They could be listening while they're commuting from and to work. Maybe they're in the kitchen and they're cooking. Um, maybe they're just relaxing at home wearing a, he, some headphones. Um, we're watching their, their smartphone. They're watching on mobile devices, on PCs. So great way to reach out and communicate with people, get your message, demonstrate your professional expertise. One in five Americans listen to podcasts, and that's from this organization, State of the Media Org. Org. So a lot of people are listening to podcasts. It's very likely you can be found and heard on a podcast. And uh, there are these podcast apps. There's a bunch of them that are out there. Um, I'm not an advocate of any one of them at this point, um, but all you have to do is Google podcast app and you can find. There are a couple that are even free. Um, if most of them do have some sort of subscription service and you can have kind of your own podcast channel and be found online. Okay? And again, develop and grow your audience because if people can find you and hear you, um, you are going to be perceived as an expert. And podcast is not yet embraced by as many people as other paradigms. So there'll be a little bit less competition in the podcast world. And you may also be seen as someone who's more um, more able to adjust to change and trying new things, and, uh, growing a business in the role and growing a company because you are willing to change and you're not just working with old technology, you're trying new ideas. So it could be a very good differentiator between you and the other people applying for those positions. Email marketing. Email marketing is a very interesting kind of digital marketing. Um, it's using email, electronic mail, um, as a means of communicating a message to your audience. And what's nice is you're commuting dire communicating directly to your audience because it is a form of what's called outbound marketing. And if you are marketers on the call, on this uh, meeting, you know the difference between inbound and outbound marketing. Most social media is actually what's called inbound marketing. You're posting content, doesn't matter if it's the written word, photographs, movies, doesn't really matter. You're posting content and you're waiting for people to find you. So that's inbound marketing. You hopefully the Google searches find you and bring people to your content. Outbound marketing is you're sending it to them. 
the more common ways or the older ways of outbound marketing could be a flyer in your mailbox. It comes to you. Commercials on TV and radio, it comes to you. You don't have to go look for it, it comes to you. So in terms of email marketing, you're initiating the conversation. And so um, you're sending your message directly to your customers, your prospects. You can target, you don't have to mass mail everybody. You can email a smaller number of people if you want. It's a great way to let people know of um, newsletters. You can educate them. You know, depending on how diverse your field is, you may want to uh, send an email newsletter once a month with a new hot topic in your area. And you'll begin, be, again, be known as somebody who is very relevant. I use email marketing in com combination with my blog post. I write on the blog post, that's the inbound marketing, hoping people will come to it. And then I send an email message out and they'll say, go read this. I just, I just posted something, go read it. And I get people to come right to my site that way. So I, I kind of use some of these strategies together. You can as well. It's very quick and easy to realize. Um, you just push the message out. You press the send button. Your clients don't need to find you because you're sending it to them. And they'll see the, me the message immediately. Where if you put a post out on social media, if they're not looking now, they won't see it now. They'll, maybe they'll see it later. So this can be a great tool to use as well. So here's the, uh, the, the, the big expensive thousand dollar question, which online platform is best for you? Well, some of you know a gentleman named Marty Latman and his answer to a lot of questions is it depends. And so you can't be on every platform at the same time. There are just too many platforms that are out there. And um, even if you found that there are a lot that are potentially good for you, there are too many, you'll spend too much time. And there are ways to auto-populate and push out to your platforms. And again, we're not deep diving into how to use these, but to be effective on any tool, you have to learn how to use it. You have to use it a while. So what you need to do is determine for yourself the one that's the most relevant for your audience, because that's your audience are the people you want to reach. And so you have to, to figure out who is your audience. So your audience, if you're in job search, they're the hiring managers, they're the companies, they're the recruiters, they're the people that should be looking for you. So you have to find out what are the tool or tools that they are using. So we do know, for instance, hiring managers typically use LinkedIn often. Recruiters typically use LinkedIn often. There are other tools they use as well. And so that may be one place that's appropriate for you. Of course, different industries may have different tools as well. Also, where are the other job seekers? What are they using? And you may say, no, no, I don't want to be where everybody else is. I want to be stand a standout. I want to be apart from everyone. Uh, no, you want to be with everybody. And the basic reason why is if everybody is there, they kind of figured it out already. You want to be found among all these other people. If the hiring managers and recruiters are looking in one or two tools specifically, you don't want to stand apart from those two tools. You want to be in those two tools. So that's that's why you want to be with the job seekers. And since this can be a little overwhelming, just start with one. Find the one that makes the most sense for you to start and get familiar with it and start using it. And that's how you begin to get effective. And then you'll experiment, you'll measure, you'll adjust. What will happen is you'll look at the performance. How many likes do I got? How many retweets am I getting? How many um, comments am I getting from other people? Are you starting to see over time a little bit of activity? If you are and you think that's good, fine. And if not, you may have to adjust your profile a little bit. You may have to adjust the content that you're writing or maybe switch to another platform. But once you find a platform that works for you, stick with it because it's very effective and keep at it, keep growing. So what to do next? And again, we're not deep diving into the how to use the tools. Find that one tool, pick that one tool and start to use it. That's what you're gonna want to do. Sign up, create an account. In most cases, it's free. It's easy to do so. So sign up and create an account, create your profile. Keep your profile professional, and this is job search. If you need any assistance, find places to get assistance. You might find webinars. Maybe um, the, your local library has classes as well. You can attend some classes. Ask people that you already know who are using certain tools 
for assistance. Maybe they can give you assistance. Uh, find a coach or a consultant or somebody else that can help you get started. And in some cases, attending a class or finding a consultant, there might be a fee associated with it. But if you get up that much faster, you hit the ground running, you might turn it into a job, up, uh, a job a little bit faster. So well worth it for you. And then just get started and just move forward. So as we wrap up, I want to let you know this slide deck is actually available online right now. So this is my website, princetonechadvisors.com. And you can see at the top, there's a menu item. It's called workshops. When you get to that menu at the bottom, there's a link called recently offered programs. And another page will open. And the very top one is this program. All my programs from this year are on my website. Um, uh, if Diane from the library wants this, I will give it to her as well. Uh, so she's welcome. She hasn't specifically asked, so I haven't specifically sent, but at the very least, you can find it there. Um, also, we are recording this presentation, so probably by tomorrow, it will be on my YouTube channel, and uh, my YouTube channel is Princeton Technology Advisors, so you can go look for that, and so that will be up by then, I think by tomorrow. Um, if you're interested in visiting a job seeker support group, if you haven't done so before, this is one that meets each Friday morning in Princeton, uh, virtually now, psgofmercercounty.org, psgofmercercounty.org. You're welcome to come and attend any meeting. Uh, on our website's event calendar, we always have the connection info for the upcoming meeting, and there's no need to pre-register. All you do is show up. Click on the link and show up, and you can email us as well. And then my contact information is also available here, but if you have any questions, I will entertain them right now. So let me go get them. Okay. Uh, let's see. Do you have a suggestion of podcasts with professional audiences. Uh, that's from Grace. Um, I don't have specific recommendations or referrals for podcasts. Um, the the, and I'm not sure really what you mean by professional audiences because you know typically the podcaster, the person giving the presentation, has some sort of theme to their podcast. So you know you may want to find podcasters based on your particular industry or a theme of interest. There are a lot of personal ones, maybe you like gardening, maybe you like pets, or maybe it's industry, maybe it's logistics, maybe it's healthcare. So you're gonna wanna find those. But when you look at the podcast sites, they have search features built into them and you should be able to find the ones that match what you are interested in. And Grace is also asking, uh, if you don't mind everyone on this uh, meeting, you may want to um, provide the name of some podcast apps. So if anyone knows any, there's Blogspot Radio. That might be one that you can use. I've been on other people's shows. I don't use podcasting myself, but I've been invited for other shows. And Mike is asking, TikTok seems to be a popular site for younger generation. Your comments. Um, yeah, my comment is that TikTok seems to be a popular site for younger generation. Um, I've never been on TikTok, so I don't have any personal experience with it at all. Um, my The limit of my experience, if you want to call that, is anytime on the news they talk about TikTok, they show a video, that's the video I've seen. <laughs> uh, I just don't have a lot of experience with TikTok. Um, it does seem to be mostly generating a younger audience. Um, but Instagram started that way. Instagram started as you could only post very short videos. And a lot of times it was uh, a younger audience that was using it to post little videos that they took on their phone and shared with each other. So it is possible that it will take off uh, once um, more and more people start gravitating. What I can tell you, my opinion is that if companies find that their clients, their customers, their prospective customers are on TikTok, those companies will be on TikTok. So if you think it's mostly a younger audience, um, maybe it's going to be some of the restaurants. Maybe it's going to be the theme restaurants. Maybe it's going to be um, 
uh, toy companies or you know who knows things that initially peel makeup you know if it's teenage girls they're probably going to learn about the latest makeup so you can go on and on about who may start using TikTok, and then it'll begin to um, evolve more organically now that the, the kids are on they're going to start looking for more things as the kids get a little older and their tastes mature they'll be looking for more things therefore more companies um, will be on Oh, Tatiana shared an interesting podcast. It's actually on Facebook. Um, George Pace um, is a gentleman who talks about a lot of job search and technology topics and the future of work. Um, he's actually going to be giving a presentation tomorrow morning uh, at the Career Support Group in Hamilton, New Jersey, but it's virtual. So you can go to careersupportgroup.org to look at the connection info for that. He's going to talk about the future of work tomorrow morning at 8.30. But he does a daily Facebook uh, promotion as well and he uses his own facebook channel and so tatiana put that there facebook.com slash keep pace keep pace is as one word the two p's so that would be another uh streaming service as well so yeah a lot of people use facebook for that purpose yep any other thoughts or questions as um we move forward actually as we wrap up let's see from Ronnie, this is slightly off topic. Could Twitter be a source for open job roles? Absolutely. Um, there are companies that will post positions on Twitter because they know um, a lot of their followers, people that use their service, um, service services or buy their uh, products are on Twitter. So yes, it is possible that they are using it. You'll find jobs there. Now, what you may not see is a very in-depth job posting you know, that could be very long. It could be, you know, we've got a new marketing manager role. Here's the link. And then it'll take you to their career page. Um, Twitter is also good for getting customer service from companies. Um, yeah, I've heard a couple of stories about that. Uh, a friend of mine, um, a coworker, um, was having trouble getting his car fixed. He had a recurring problem, and I won't name the brand. And um, he was just becoming very frustrated. The dealer wasn't able to solve the problem for whatever reason. Not really sure why the dealer couldn't solve the problem. So he went on um, Twitter and basically tweeted, does anybody know how to fix this? And the auto company cop contacted him. And uh, he got to then talk to someone. And then apparently the auto company got directly involved with contacting the dealer. And I guess then explained how to fix this one particular problem. So, yeah, it's a great way to get attention from companies. Absolutely. Um, some people also will put, you know, observations, you know, great service from a company, poor service from a company. So they give you almost like a rating. So I guess that's possible as well. Let's see. Any other questions before we wrap up for the afternoon? Give you another moment or two. And uh, if not, I guess we can wrap up in a moment. No? Okay. All right, folks. Okay, another thank you message. So thank you for the thank you message. Very sweet of everybody. So, um, yeah, that's our program. Do promote yourself beyond your resume. Just using a resume for job search is not sufficient any longer. Uh, a good resume will land you the interview. But you can't get the interview if you're not being found. And so that's what we really want you to do is have new ways of being found, new ways of promoting yourself, new ways of standing out among the competition, which are the other people that are applying for the same position. So you're welcome to contact me, of course, if you have any other information, you're welcome to, or the PSG group that I listed before. And uh, if not, I guess we will just wrap up and say, have a good day. Bye, everybody. <laughs>